ันมันใกล้อะไรนะHello, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. So, welcome everyone to this meeting. It will be our first event by the engineers chapter. So, on timber design. And I would like to thank all of you who are on board and all of you who are participating. So on board, we're going, to, we're going to be listening to our speakers who will guide us through timber design, both as the structural design, how to, how to use timber in structural design, and also in architectural design. So at this juncture, I want to introduce our chapter chair, engineer Justa Zotwani, who is going to introduce our vice president, to, so that we can then proceed to our moderator, Engineer Tambo, who will guide us through the session. Engineer Twani. Hello, I believe you can hear me. Uh, can you hear me, Muguru? Yes, we can, Sharon. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Uh, thank you, Muguru, uh, for uh, putting this together. And uh, uh, it's indeed uh, uh, a great afternoon today. Uh, as Muguru has said, this is going to this is the first event by the engineers uh, chapter. We have uh, several others uh, lined up, and uh, we have uh, we endeavour to make sure that uh, all of them uh, are created. So all uh, engineers will be attending will be adding their uh, professional development units from uh, uh, our activities. And there are a few other exciting ones, including a visit to Lamu Port later in the year, and uh, a proposed visit to the Horn of Africa Gateway Development Project, uh, a road that uh, runs from Isiolo uh, upwards to connect uh, 
Somalia and Ethiopia. Uh, with those uh, remarks, I want to uh, thank uh, the speakers uh, that have been put together today for accepting our invitation uh, to talk to us about uh, timber design. Um, and uh, in the interest of time, I am uh, most uh, delighted uh, to uh, welcome uh, none other than the Vice uh, Chair of uh, the Architectural Association of Kenya, architect uh, Florence Nyole, to give us uh, her remarks. And I think uh, uh, all of us who are in the law, who are in the know are aware that uh, uh, she is also uh, the president in waiting uh, as we look forward to the elections on 27th. Welcome, uh, uh, architect uh, Florence. All right, uh, good afternoon. And uh, thank you so much, Engineer Otwani, uh, chairperson of the engineers chapter. And I'm very privileged and honored to be here this afternoon. Uh, I would love to maybe make a dis disclosure that I am representing the president, architect Wilson Mugambi, who was not able to uh, give this, his remarks at this point and uh, roped me in for, for the few minutes I have. I'm actually attending another function still on behalf of AK. Uh, so just uh, juggling quite a, a few things. But uh, straight to the uh, matter of this day, I'm very happy to note the conversations that will be taking place uh, this afternoon regarding timber. Uh, this material has been something that we are pursuing. I think the last one year or so, we've been quite keen on it. Uh, and I'm very, very happy to note that uh, we are continuing to uh, discuss uh, timber. Uh, we, we have had a very uh, interesting uh, engagement uh, last year. We, we, we had an engagement with the uh, Swedish, um, uh, Swedish embassy uh, regarding timber. We had an engagement with um, uh, the Kenya Climate uh, Investment uh, Corporation uh, regarding timber. And we even had uh, a two-week um, uh, CPD of sorts for our young professionals uh, as regards timber. And I can see uh, Engineer Nashon here who will be taking us through. He was also part of that program and, and we got very many uh, participants in the same. And uh, on board also are the partners that I'm very happy to see are in this particular engagement. Uh, that is Arup. Uh, we have uh, Buildex as well as uh, uh, Rothoblast. I may, I may not say I pronounce it well, so thank you very much, Engineers Chapter, for setting us off this year. I believe this is our very first webinar or seminar for the association uh, online, and we're very privileged to have it uh, being kicked off by the Engineers Chapter. I think it's important that we discuss uh, alternative building materials uh, in the construction industry, especially when it comes to uh, structural uh, materials, and timber is really one of them. And I really look forward to uh, hearing what the presenters have in terms of the discussion around the structural timber. I'm also very happy to note uh, that uh, we are increasing in terms of the number of partners who are uh, keen on uh, timber construction and timber design. So mine is just to welcome all of you on behalf of the president and to uh, hope that everybody will pick one or two things that they can take home and begin to think around when it comes to designing with timber. And to also congratulate the engineers chapter on setting us off on a very high note with a very uh, well-versed um, uh, well uh, uh, group of panelists for this particular session today. So thank you very much. much. I wish you all the best. And uh, I just want to note that I may not stay all the way to the end because I have to attend uh, to the other matters, but um, I wish you, I wish everybody all the best and uh, uh, we pray that this may go well. So back to you, uh, I believe in Engineer Otwani and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Architect uh, Florence, uh, Vice Chair, for those uh, uh, remarks. Uh, I would like to take this uh, back to Muguru. Muguru, back to you. Thank you very much, Engineer Otwani, and thank you, Architect Nyole, for your welcoming remarks. So at this point, before I hand over to Engineer Tambo, I would also want to acknowledge that Rotoplas, and I hope I'm also pronouncing it correctly, are the ones who are sponsoring us for this webinar, and we'll be hearing from them. So I now pass it on to Engineer Tambo, who will be our moderator during this session. Thank you. Thank you, Engineer, very much. I'd like to welcome all the 94 attendees this afternoon uh, as you join us to discuss uh, timber as a construction material and how we can best use it in the built and natural environment. 
So we intend to have a, a very interactive and uh, insightful that will in, entail. Uh, we're going to have three presentations. The first one will be from our main sponsor, Rotoblast, and that will be uh, done. Uh, we're going to be going to be who is going to take us through that is going to be Felix uh, Odero. Then afterwards, we'll have a presentation from architect George Wekesa from BuildX, who's going to talk about the architectural design using architectural design using timber. And lastly, we'll have a session from uh, Andrew Lawrence, who's a fellow and director at ARU, who's going to discuss uh, structural design using timber. Afterwards, we'll take a few questions that will come up during the presentations so that our, uh, the, present, the presenters can, uh, attend, can address all those questions and concerns from all the attendees. And afterwards, we'll close the session at about 5.20 p.m. or thereabout. So I'd like to welcome Felix Odero. Felix Odero is uh, a technical sales representative of Rotoblast company in, East in the East African market. He's based in Nairobi. He's still an undergraduate student of civil engineering, but is, uh, has a very strong interest in wood engineering and timber construction technology. So we'll hear from Felix Odero from Rotoblast, Karibu Sana Felix. Thank you so much, um, Nishkan. Um, I'm really privileged and I want to thank the organizers for, for this event. Um, Rotoblast is happy. Uh, let me pass greetings from the headquarters and my colleagues, they're very happy to sponsor this event. It's one of the, one of the uh, inroads that we have to ensuring that timber is a complementary material to other structural uh, construction materials. Thank you so much to the organizers. Thank you for the attendees for creating time to be with us during this time. And I wish you get what you what you wanted to learn in um, in this webinar. So quickly, I will not want to waste time. I will just go through my presentation and share with you some ideas from Rotoblast what we do and. Yeah, what we are, what we do, and our participation in ensuring timber as a construction material is progressively used and progressively incorporated in our design and construction. So, thank you. I will um, quickly share my screen, not to waste your time. So, please tell me if you can share, if you can see my screen. Yes, we can, Felix. Proceed. Okay, just a minute. So, Rotoblast, we are an Italian, Italian, Italian company. We are based in Italy and we supply hardware and um, fastening of uh, hardware and fastening solution for timber industry and as well as fall protection system for safely working at height. So generally, this is the presentation. This is our, before I go to the presentation, this is our social media accounts, how you could reach to us, how you could see some of the projects we are doing and some of the projects we are involved in and the, the common trends that we have in the market. So there is, this is, this is our LinkedIn image, um, LinkedIn contact. If you, if you want to know more about us, then you just go through our LinkedIn page and you will find all the updates about Rotoblast. So we are we are based in um, headquartered in Italy, somewhere in Cotasia, with more than 50 uh, representation in 50 countries. Our sales force is in 50 countries, and we have um, more than 500 collaborators as well. So we technically just a small profile of Rotoblast, the company has been in the market for 30 years and more than 14 years of international collaboration. Where we are um, uh, in, the, in Africa, because I want to also tell you where we are in Africa, which currently we have um, two, two subsidiaries in Africa. We have one in Morocco, we have one in South Africa, and then we also have one coming up in the East African region. So, this is the reason why we decided to now look at you, look look for you guys and show you some of what we do. If because 
the, the moment you know what we are doing and we also know what we're doing, this is the progress for the company as well. So we have subsidiaries in more than more than 25 countries and we have collaborators in um, five, more than 500 collaborators as well in um, with, with in, 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 in globally, that is the global footprint of Broto Plus. Also, what we do, I've just, just like I've told you, we supply hardware and fall protection system in the timber industry. We also promote the use of structural timber as a building material. We also educate um, through our Roto School. We have technicians and woodworkers. We have courses and seminars and webinars for our training. And then we also have a global footprint so that um, we have coverage throughout um, the world and in the countries of interest. And so in Africa, what we have done so far in Africa, we have partnered with the people who are involved with CLT projects, the cross laminated timber projects. We also have done with the roof, the guys who are doing the roof installation. We also have partnered with people who do the timber framing structures, the decking and the pajolas and the post bases, all this. So we have collaborated with these guys both in the market market-wise and in training as to ensure that our products are in line with the market um, market requirements and, and, and um, the, the market requirements and the regulation. So this will interest you guys because it is a, a photo that we, we like sharing a lot. This is a photo of um, a ship that ran ground in South Africa and it was it was it was a, a ship that was made of South American hardwood and it rained ground and then 100 years the, the wood was used to reconstruct this bridge you see how how good looking it is with um, a nice picture of the table mountain from it so it's a very strong bridge out of the out of the the, the, the timber that was the wood that was from the ship that wrecked um, only one of them after 100 years of 100 years had to be replaced in it, its entirety just to um it's still in our ideas that timber is a durable material. If you compare 100 years, then not even uh, concrete can be reused in this kind of application for all this time. So just to instill in our ideas that uh, our, our minds that um, timber is a durable material and to demystify some of the facts that people say that timber, timber is not as durable as people think. So that is one thing that you will see. This is our... Our, our our headquarters, the warehouse, that is fully automated and uh, completely built of timber. This is just to show some of our collaborators that we also practice what we preach. And we also take part in what, what we preach actually. It is 20 meters high and fully automated. And that is, you can see the, the, the outlook of the, uh, of, the, of the warehouse is quite good, good looking. And then that was it in, in construction. That is during construction, our warehouse at the headquarters in Cotasia, Italy. Um, just to tell you that we also practice what we preach. I will start my presentation quickly with um, a bit of ABC about wood, because we are in the market for the timber as a structural material. And I decided to share with you some of the ABC about wood as a material. So. Generally, the categories of wood is um, we have softwood and hardwood. It's it's quite sometimes it's 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 quite um, easy to identify them, but at most at, at also sometimes it's not very easy to identify the the wood depending on their characteristics and properties. So basically, the difference between softwood and hardwood is softwood is majorly got from uh, the conifer trees, and then the hardwood uh, from the deciduous trees and all this, and then. Also, a difference in in light in in the weight. Generally, softwood is light in weight, and then hardwood is uh, dense in weight. In in terms of structural application, mostly we use um, softwood in structural as a structural uh, in structural application, and mostly the hardwoods we use them in the in the furniture and in finishing because they have a very good finishing. So mostly. The structural, the structural timber that we, we interact with is usually the softwood. And strength-wise, you talk about you talk about hardwood and softwood, then hardwood is more quality than, than the softwood. But also the advantages is 
the softwood is it is very easy to harvest. It takes the maturity time is is um it's, it's not as long as the hardwood. So it's the talk about the availability and the cost and all this. So mostly in our in our application structural application we interact with the softwood, and that is why we also that is where our 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 materials are mostly channel towards the softwood and we also have versions for the for the adult another um, another slide that i would want i also wanted to share with you is on the advantages of timber as a construction material um quick timber has very good performance in as, as a material in terms of seismic behavior it's also possible to achieve multi-story building with timber because now there is um it, it just here close to us there's um there's a budget uh, tower that is coming up in Zanzibar, which is a multi-story building on, um, on, on purely made of timber. So hybrid timber. And then also timber has a good, excellent weight performance ratio. That is its slight, so it's, it's very easy to, to, to use it in terms of structural application. Then the other, this one's, this one's just um, the advantages in terms of energy, low production cost for, high performance energy performance because timber always absorbs more 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 carbon it's it's naturally wood they always absorb um co2 and timber as a material it will will enable the absorption of co2 and reduce the emission of this um this 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 carbon dioxide and then just to quickly I don't know if I'm moving fast, but um, I have several slides and very good things to show you. That's why I'm, I'm quite moving uh, fast. But we we categorize mainly the, the the timber that you interact with. The market can be solid timber, laminated timber. The laminated timber could be cross laminated or laminated vinyl lumber. It could also be glued laminated timber. So. Generally, my uh, my idea is always that timber has very good structural performance as a material, and it is coming not to replace um, brick and mortar, but is coming as a complementary um, material for structural application. And then this is just to show you a solid timber, uh, the post post and beam. As you can see, this is just uh, not there is not no not not so much modification that has been done to the timber. So ap an application for the solid timber, you if this is I'm I'm sure you've interacted with most of this. And then uh, this is an application of glued laminated timber. Sometimes if you're using um, timber, it it might not be possible to achieve the your dimensions, your beam dimensions. Maybe in terms of length. And also in terms of depth or something like this, so it's all it's possible to to use the glued lamination technology in order to achieve um, the depths and your length. So this, for example, is um, is a uh, one of the glue glue lamps in um, in Namibia, just here in Africa as well. It's possible to achieve. You can see it's possible to achieve a length of 27 meters long for the truss, and the dimensions are also. I've seen dimensions where you 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 have glue lumps and then you you achieve the, depending on the the depth that you want to achieve you then it's very possible to to to, to achieve using the glue lamp mostly the glue lamp beams can be can be used in pajolas can be used in as roof trusses where depending on your design so this is a good application there are a few people who do the glue lamps um in south africa we have a few just quite four or five of them that do the glue lamps uh, and you can easily find depending on your design then you get the glue lamp uh, of your choice and then the the lens can also be achieved because sometimes sometimes you timber is not quite um it's not quite homogeneous so sometimes you can you can uh, you may want not to maybe just not to achieve the lens but sometimes you may want to replace the portions with the defects uh, and you want to like remove them out of so you can achieve using the the, the finger jointing so you just cut the section off and then you just uh, join the two pieces with the finger joints so it's you just make a finger joint and you can achieve this kind of um uh technology so it's the 
the final the final the the idea is that we want to improve the strength of the beams the strength of the beams so that the final product is more it has good quality than the individual strips so we have strips that are joined together uh, in parallel directions to achieve the glue lamp so this is this is just one of the new then this is now the um, this is a, a picture of pictorial representation of the laminated vinyl lumber so this can also be used um, in different structural applications as well and then this one this is a picture that was taken just here in Nairobi it was it's dated a long time this was in um, sometime in the past when uh, Buildex was in was doing having a, a project on CLT, and they they brought they brought CLT pro, from um, from from South Africa. This is just to show you how easy it, it is to, to transport the panels and to transport the timber from one point to another. So imagine uh, you transport concrete from from maybe South Africa to this. It's it's going it's not possible. So this is just to, to tell you some of the advantages to work because it's the ease of transport. So basically you can have the panels and you transport them and ship them in, in trucks and something like this. And then what are some of the projects that um, if you're doing, you could be interested in our, pro uh, in our products. When you're dealing with uh, homes and solid timber structures, that is something that if you're, if you're dealing with, then you could be interested in our products. If you're also doing homes then on timber framing and framing structures, you can also be interested in some of our products we have for you. And then if you're also doing log house, you could also be interested in some of our products we have for you. So just, just to tell you if our, a range of products, just to bring your mind, if you maybe you could have such products coming up or such products going on or such, such products that you have done before involving this kind. So if you are doing the log house system, then you can also be interested in some of our products. Also, if you're doing, um, we, we have products for the outdoor timber, um, outdoor timber design or something like this application. If you're doing decking, so we have products that can help you in, in, in decking and all this, the outdoor environment. So um, you see this, this kind of products, if you, if you are designing maybe a, a decking, a deck or something like this, or just an outdoor, for, for outdoor application, we have also, uh, materials for that this one i've taken I, I also decided to share you with this picture just to tell you some of the advantages of working with this cross laminated timber as you can see on your um, oh as you can see on your um, far right this one it is um it is possible the site does looks like it is um quite hilly or something like this so it's an irregular in regular site and you need your structure maybe in this kind of um, environment so it is possible to have uh, clt structures even in uh, environments that uh, have very tricky site access it is also possible to have your uh, clt structures sorry it is also possible to have uh, your clt structures cross laminated timber structures on environments with poor soil condition because of the lightweight and then it is also preferable, it is a sustainable material of const for construction because look, after the end of the construction, this is all the waste that is down here. And then this can be collected and reused in different applications. So for example, if you're using maybe other materials, you find that it will, it will be, it will, once you say, for example, um, concrete, if, if it, this is the waste, then it's, if it has, it has, um, it has, a uh, if, if it is, this is the waste, then after some time, it, it will cure and then permanent there. So you can easily, you can easily achieve um, a tidy site condition using some of this. So that, that I decided to just include and then the beauty and the, you can also, if you are working on an elevated site, then CLT application will be something that you want to consider. Then just to, to bring you home here, just around, Mostly, I have learned that um, people who are really fascinated about wood, they, they always, even if they have structures that um, are on, on stone, and then they want to have extensions 
on extensions on timber. So this is just close to us. This is Cape Free, uh, Karura. If you go there, you will find that they, they have the offices in uh, the, the, the first, the ground floor is in, on stone and then the extension they have done in timber. So this is just to also tell us that some of our, um, organ um, as organ call it organizations around us, they are also pro timber and they're also preaching, uh, practicing what they preach on the use of timber as a material. So this one, if you go to Kefri, Karora, you will find this this extension. I hope most of you have seen that as well. And then the kind of uh, people we collaborate with, quickly we collaborate with carpenters because for timber, you need skilled manpower to, you need skilled carpenters to work with, um, with the timber technology. So we usually collaborate with carpenters, usually offer trainings and courses for the carpenters and as well as the designers that are, have projects. So we, we have a technical team that collaborates with the designers on to achieve, just to, to achieve a good design on, on timber. Then we also collaborate with the um, major builders and contractors. If you have pro projects that are going in this direction, we also want, because some of the, some of the products, they, they order from us directly or something like, something like this. So we also work with the major builders and contractors. We also have trainings and we also collaborate with them in terms of delivery and shipment of our products because timber is quite a, a specialized a specialized industry such that some of these products are just tailored to a specific um, specific clients so we deal sometimes we deal with them directly and then so that is just that was just abc about wood and timber and then now to introduce um rothoblas what we do is that we operate in five product lines so we supply fasteners and connectors for timber, the joinery part of the, of the timber. We also supply tapes and membranes for air tightness and waterproofing. We also do sound, we also supply soundproofing profiles because timber, like all other lightweight materials, like steel, sound is always a problem. And we always want to ensure that there is comfort. So we also do soundproofing prof profiles as well. And then another interesting uh, product line that we also do is that we also supply fall protection system to ensure that worker tight is always safe. Worker tight has not always been safe, but uh, to, to reduce the risk of worker tight, we also supply fall protection system. You will see some of these products that we have in this particular line. And so to tell you just about this, about screws, because we in fasteners, we do supply screws, plates, membranes, and epoxy and all this. So just to give you some idea of, of screws, technical idea about screws, what you need to, to consider while working with screws or what you need when requesting for screws, some of this. So majorly screws are divided in two broad categories. That is partial threaded screw and full threaded screw. Most of the time the partial threaded screw are used for carpentry application, but then for the full threaded screw, we always use them for structural application. And then some of the some of the information that as a technical person, as a, as a designer or as an engineer, you need to to check while working with screws is that first you need to check look at the the torque set, the head of the screw. Is there an identifying number that can you can easily trace back when in case of failure or something like this? Because the screws are always produced in batches, so once. Once you, you check whether there is an identification number, then it can easily be traced so that it can be taken back to the processing or something like this, or we can, we can review what happened during um, the design or something like this, or the quality control or something like this. So for the quality control part of the, of the design, you need to be quite aware about the, the talk set, the identification number and the length of the screw. Usually this length of the screw you are very keen if you're looking at um, if you're looking at the carpentry application of the screws, then you will be very careful about the shank length of the screw because you need it. It is the shank length that tells you shank length of the screw and the, the dimension of the of, of the joinery you want to achieve that tells you the correct type of screw that you want to achieve. So always be careful about uh, be keen about checking about the identification of the screw. And the, the length, that is the shank length for, applic uh, for application. About the, um, the structural screws, you will be more careful about the diameter. 
And then you should also be careful about the certification. So usually the, for any structural material, you must it's always very important to look at the certification that um, the standards, the relevant standard that the material has gone through. So for our material, for example, Rotobles is an Italian it's an Italian company. So all our products are manufactured under license, and we have European uh, technical assessment uh, certification that we have that our schools come with. Also, you was you should be keen about the availability of the technical data sheet and technical information about uh, the screws. If you are working with the screws, this is all available on our comprehensive web, um, catalogs. We have catalogs with all the technical information and all the technical information about the screws separately. We have also the technical data sheet on, on our website. So if you, if you look at some of our products, you select a product and then all the technical information, the technical data sheet and the catalog are available for, you can just pull them from the, from the website. And then another thing that you should also be careful about is the minimum distances when you're working with screws. Because otherwise, if, you, if you're not careful, then you're going to, you could be in a position to ruin to ruin your, your timber when working with the screws. So you are, should be careful about the minimum distances. That is also available on our technical uh, catalogs that we have. Also, another thing that you should be careful while working with screws is the, stuck, the static information. Mostly, um, the, technical, the, 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 the technical information about uh, our screws are done using a, a, a software called screws. So we have our technical information, this, this, the strength characteristics of our products. So you should also be careful about this before you check screw. So you look at the technical information you have, you analyze it properly, and then you make the right choice of choosing which screw you want to work with. And then just to quickly show you some of our screws that we have, mostly we have a, a lot of like more than 10,000 screws, but just for our structural application, the one that will be interesting to you is the use of um, the countersunk wood screw. This is called the HBS. It is majorly used for general um, uh, carpentry application and general wood application. So it's also it's also one of the the good good um, good uh, screws that you could use for just general application. So it's available in uh, this is made of galvanized carbon steel, but then we also have one with the EVO coating. So it's called HBS EVO. So the EVO coating is just a screw that is suited for outdoor application. So it has an EVO coating. So the coating makes it possible to resi um, quite resistant to aggressive environments. If you're working with uh, quite aggressive woods that maybe you see it's quite aggressive woods that could um, aid corrosion or something like this, or you're working maybe in an island where corrosion from the beach is a problem, you then we have screws called the HBS Evo, quite a good 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 screw for outdoor application as well. And then this screw, this is a paling screw. I've shared with this because most of the when I when I walk around and the, most of the clients I've met, they're always asking about the paling screw. So this has a very good the, the, the unique part of this screw is the is the the flange head. Most designers always like it because of the flange head. So it provides a good health, um, a, a good um, head pull through. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite good tensile, it's quite good intention. So quite good, good performance, um, good performance intention. So you can use it, use it for pollen applic application. So this is one also that may also interest you. And you can also maybe check around and see the kind of um, application and the kind of technical information about this group. And then quickly to take you about the, um, the, the structural screws, we also do, we also do a full threaded structural screw for structural application. And this is, this is uh, the structural screw that I'm talking about. So usually you, if you want to provide an, an interlock at um, at 45 degrees, then this kind of connection, it is a concealed connection where you have, say your, your primary beam and then you have your secondary beam and then the connection interlocks at 45 degrees. So quite a good connection. People always like it when you want to achieve um, 
a concealed connection. So one of the one of the ways of achieving a concealed connection is just by basically using full threaded screw and interlocking them at 45 degrees. It's also available in um, it's also available in uh, the Evo version, the one I was telling you about, where it's it has an Evo coating that provides it with the capacity of resisting uh, corrosion in in a long time. So actually, the Evo version is the Evo coating. For me, I think it is um, it's quite it's quite a good coating because then you are, you don't have to worry about corrosion with this kind of screw. And then I will also because I, I'm going. I don't know if I'm going too fast, but I, um, I'm just sharing some of the material. It's a long it's a long slide. So some of the some of the design are also happy with the this kind of products that we have the concealed connection. See, most of the time or some of the time that your client may not be interested to see the metal part of the connection when you are having um when you're having a beam to is to timber concrete timber 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 steel so they may not be happy with uh, seeing the the metal connection because they always want to see the beauty of construction so sometimes they may not want to see um the metal part of the connection but still for you to achieve the the strength and all this you need to connect wood to to steel as well so this is a this is an example of a concealed connection that we have so they are in uh, they are in three categories this one is where you just it's it's, it's this is connected to the the primary beam and then you slot you slot the secondary beam and then it will just come and interlock in, interlock here so this is quite technical and maybe will require special skills to do that and then a better option is where you have this kind of a lock connection where you just have this kind of material chosen depending on the size of the secondary beam and then it will just come it's 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 you fix this on the on the on the, on the primary beam and then you fix this on the secondary beam and then it will just come and interlock so it it provides three advantages this kind of connection because one is that you achieve the aesthetic value of your construction then another one is that you protect the steel from corrosion and then finally you protect the steel from from fire so because you protect the steel from fire just to ensure the durability of your structure so they are also available in um, they also available in evo version just to ensure that when you're dealing with aggressive woods then you have the correct um, you, you have the correct connection and the structural integrity of your structure is not compromised and then just to show you some of the some of just to share with you some of the the loading on a structure so this I made, you could have vertical loads on a structure and horizontal loads. So it could be self it could be live loads, and then it could also be snow in maybe the European environment. And then this could also be wind or seismic. So if you have such loading on your structure, because you expect this kind of loading, and then most of the time, sometime you, you, you may expect that your structure may have a sliding horizontal force. Also, you may also expect that your structure may suffer from an uplift or something like this. So, so we have, you have this kind of problem so in order to achieve this kind of pro to, uh, to provide solution to this kind of problem you may be interested in use of pl uh, plates and angle brackets so usually usually in the general theory about plates and angle brackets is that you have usually you have the tall the tall brackets for or the use the, the use of perforated plates to to provide the tens the, just the tensile resistance to to the uplift and then you could also have here or square brackets that um, prevent the the horizontal sliding so these are also some of the products that we supply our plates are plates and all our products are certified they are we have including we have uh the the engineering values that are attached on our catalog and all all available on our website and then we also have you can also you can also achieve because when we are working with designers then we also want to look at the calculations some of the some of these choices that you make are based on your calculations so we have a software it's called my project software uh, it's 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 free it's available on our website you just download it and then we have also tutorials a, a youtube channel that is will show you how it operates and all this so in in this software you just key in the the basic details about your connection and then it will generate it will generate um calculation 
uh, based on your choice and tell you whether it is a good connection to achieve in that particular application. So that is just a general theory. Let me just show you in in um, in application how you you want to achieve. So this is an example of this is an example of a plate, a perforated plate that is a, is used to achieve to to provide the tensile strength for the structure. So as you can see that you you have this panel ending at this point, and then you have like. Um, a, a floor or something like this, and then you also want to join it with another panel. So as a, a plate, a perforated plate would be suitable for this kind of application. There are pre-cuts, so we have depending on depending on your choice, because our products are such that they are the is the market the, the market trend. We always update them, and we always want to ensure that our users they always know what they're doing with the what the, the kind of information the, the user awareness. When they, so that is done achieved by our website. All the information is available on our website. And then, so for good good news for the engineers is that you don't need to choose. You don't you don't need to worry about uh, going for square brackets and the, the the tall brackets. So we have a universal. We have a specific uh, line of products where we just have universal brackets that offer good resistance for shear and tensile loads. It's called the Titan bracket, the, the, the Titan angle bracket. So it is used for this kind of application. Just to take you back, this is, as you can see, this is the this is this is um the 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 wall, and then this is the floor, and then the the red line you're seeing is just a detailing on soundproofing profile, so that we don't want um you don't you always don't want that on top of, on the floor on the floor upstairs there is transmission of vibration to to the, the the living room down or something like this so this is not this is not um completely but it is reducing the vibration because timber just like la, all other lightweight materials they suffer from uh vibration and all this and then also to tell you here this is the titan bracket can be used for connection Connection of connection to concrete and connection to timber, the, the, the CLT panels as well. So we also do concrete anchors. Quality um, with this as per the standards, we also do concrete anchors, chemical anchors. We also do uh, the we also do the the expansion anchors. We, all range of anchors we also do them in stainless steel, and we also have them in Evo version and galvanized electro galvanized carbon steel so we another another line that could also be interesting to you guys that we deal with is the um, the truss hangers we we have them in such that they, we are they are certified for different application so like for example the one you're seeing here is an ex an, an, a, a, a truss hanger with an with external wing so depending on what your choice is um, these are these are these are certified. They are very inexpensive, not so expensive, and then it will help you to achieve the kind of uh, design that you want. So basically, we supply all ranges of angle brackets as well, no, not not truss hangers. And then connection to the ground is always a problem. You we we always if you have posts and you want to connect them to the ground because. When you connect them to the ground, you always want to look at the water drainage system as well. Timber as a material is, if allowed, if if you expose it to moist to water and you allow it to cure properly, then it is not a problem. But if you allow it to get to a damp condition, then this is a problem. So we also have post bases that enable us to achieve um, connection to the ground. So look at this. We we have them that is, uh, we have them in adjustable. And we also have them in concealed. So just the same way, if you want to achieve a concealed connection, then you would want to go for our angle brackets. So basically, it's something that you can also consider when you want to achieve connection of your post to the ground. And then just on this, I've not included in our slide, then we also have products that um, enable you to achieve a connection from um, column to slab. It's called the pillar and the spider. So it's, it's, it's basically, um, you, you go to our website and you will find it. It's, um, it's quite a good way of transferring load from the column to the slab uh, or from column to column. 
So it's a good material that um, I wish I would have included, but just to uh, um, not make a bulky work for you guys, you can also check that as well. Then this is just to make my point that connection to the ground has not always been easy. You look at, this is one of the projects in, in, in uh, just here in Karen where they asked, they, you did, if somebody did a, um, they did a construction and then they were doing now the renovation. And the, one of the problems they had is the, the rotting of the, the base of, the, of, of their posts. So to avoid this kind of, this kind of uh, problem, you would want to, to use post bases because the timber post will always, the timber structure should always be installed at a higher level than the water drainage. So this is something you will want to work on um, products like these ones. So the technical information about these products are available on our website. They are available on our catalogs. If you are interested in our catalogs, then you can also reach to me. I'm just in Nairobi. I can also bring you some of these technical catalogs so you go through them. And then also to, to, to share with you is that we also have plates. Um, we also have screws for plates, uh, screws, nails, and for plates, just uh, specifically designed for plates. So if you're working with timber plates, timber to 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 uh, not timber plates steel steel plates you want to connect them to your timber then we have plates uh plate screws that are specifically designed for this they're also available in evo version just to ensure that your outdoor environment your connection in the outdoor environment is always safe and you, it does not corrode so it's something like this this is the same lock that i was telling you about where you will just have this um on on on, on the primary beam and then this on the secondary beam, and then they will just quickly interlock. You achieve a concealed connection in this case. And then this is also something I wanted to tell you about. It's called the alustad. So just to quickly show you that the tall bracket that I was telling you about to that is connected to achieve the, a good tensile um, strength for your panels and connecting it to the the floor. Then this is one. And then this is this is the, the concrete anchor. And then down here, this material is called the alustat. So this alustat, basically, the idea is that, you see, see the concrete is not always level most of the time it, because the, the, the cure ring is all dependent about the, it's, it's always affected. So sometimes you have your panels and you, you, you have some, of, some parts of your panels going up. If you put uh, your, if you have your panels directly on, on, on concrete, then you will have, you, you will have this scenario where panels sometimes want to, they are not level. So you will, um, you will have some sort of shear between the, the panels. So to achieve a setting on concrete, connection to concrete. And then another product line that we do with, just to quickly tell you, is that we also do tips and tips and uh, air tightness membranes for durability of your timber structures so if you if you want if you want to if you if you want to achieve durability then most of the time around your around your window with, with window and all these openings you always want to seal them using our tips so we have tips the same tips the, the we have tips this this it's the same application just different quality and um different application in this case. So this is just an example of some of our tips. Um, we, these are also, the FlexiBand has worked in our, in our market in the Kenyas. We, we have some of these uh, companies working with them. And then also this slide, I just wanted to, to share with you, just to let you know that always the, say, the saying is that the devil is in the detailing. So if you if you don't have a proper detailing for your timber structure, then durability always depends on the detailing. So proper detailing, you properly detail your structure, then you achieve durability. So just to tell you that your structure, you need to you need to detail it properly so that you achieve air and wind air and air tightness, and then you should also want to connect it properly to the ground. You should also want to um, steal your door 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 and window openings, and you not window openings, but the window profiles, you always want to seal them. And then you also want also to know the, the, the behavior of, because these tips, you also want to know the behavior of, of the tips you are using. So this, these products, you always have the fire rating on the technical catalog. So you can also look around and you see 
which one is good for your app, the application of the project you're handling. And then just to quickly tell you about um, air and wind tightness, um, it's that it's, it, yes, it, they can act together, but sometimes there is a slight difference because you always, you always have the, the air, the air tightness is basically it's used for, it's, it's used to retain the energy efficiency or the, the, the energy of your structure, just to, to ensure that you, if you don't spend a lot of money, um, pumping money into the, the, the air conditioners or something like this, and then you, your energy is escaping. So it's like you're doing zero work. So you will have an air, air tightness membrane in this case profile. And then you, when you have talk about wind tightness, this is basically used to protect the insulation and the casing. So it's, it's, it's the, like there are two different um, the, the profiles if you want to detail in this case. So the difference, I will not go back to, uh, much to it. I will share the slide. So at least you, you go through it and then you will also understand on your own. And then it's when you're working with our products, then you can choose depending on the environment because one problem you have with the membrane is sometimes if you if you choose the wrong tape or the wrong membrane then you will experience a, um, a situation where your membrane your tape is expanding your tape is you know contracting or something like this so depending on the environment you have on our on our website and with our technical team just you just key in and we match for example our, our region is a hot climate so you can just come to the hot climate part and just look at the kind of detailing that you want to, to achieve the kind of good product mix for your membranes and profiles. So this you can achieve depending on, on your this the way anywhere you're working with the project. This has been achieved by categorizing just uh, place regions in their uh, temperature and all this. So their climatic condition, climatic condition. And then you can choose the right tape for the kind of application. This is very handy when you are working this kind because if you choose the wrong, if you choose the wrong tape or you choose the wrong membrane, then you will always have a problem. Say that 90, it's always a hundred percent done or zero percent done. And then this is just um, an example of a picture of uh, the application of the, the membrane. So we have the brandering, and then you have our our transparent membrane just in, in, below below the brandering. So yes, th that is just one application. And then just to quick, quickly introduce the, the two other product lines that I want, so, I want to introduce. Another interesting product line that we deal with is the soundproofing, where you will always, the theory of soundproofing, the, you can always achieve this in three ways for timber. One is that you always want to increase the density because if timber is lightweight, so if you increase the density, then you will you you can achieve the the soundproofing or something like this. But CLT has never been cost if has never been that um, it's not. If you look at the the cost of the panels, then it's not a very cost effective way of achieving this kind of uh, detailing. So uh, one way is to increase the density just by if you're working with CLT. Then maybe you could uh, increase the number of uh, panels that you're working with, and then another way that you could also achieve um, the soundproofing is by separating the members. So you because sound travels from one layer to another layer. So if you separate, if you have your panels and then you separate them, so look at this. If you look at this, then you will realize that from this 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 member to this this member down here, the, there is a layer. This, this soundproofing layer that is in between them. So you have a resilient profile uh, below it. So it enables you to achieve, um, to minimize or to reduce to an extent the, 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 vibra the, the transmission of vibration. Then another way, of course, is to seal the openings um, because some, some sound also uh, go through the openings. So look at the, this is this is sealing the, the detailing on how to seal the openings. Um, the ceiling of the opening. So you can also achieve it by, so this is an example of a silent floor. You look at this, this is an example of a silent floor where you will have, you will have um, um, uh, below, below, your strap, below your panels. So you have a silent floor or depending on the detailing, whichever, whichever you choose to work with. And then 
this is an example of um, timber concrete um, detailing. So you can see you can see the, also the use of the full threaded screw, the 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 the, the VGZ screw, the full threaded screw, and then screed will be poured on top of this. So an example of a detailing on timber concrete. So I also wanted to to share with you this so that. You, 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 it, it also comes to our mind in this case. And then um, but finally on our product line that I wanted to touch on is that um, worker tight has never been safe. So we always want to ensure that we reduce the risk of fatalities in, in our construction. So one of the product lines we also have is the fall protection where we supply systems for use while working at height. So in this range, what we do is that we supply lifelines, the anchor lines. We also supply anchor points. We also supply collective protection and the personal protection equipment. This is in this line we majorly deal with installers, uh, safety safety line installers. We also de deal with the uh, training institution for safety. For example, there is um, we partner with the KLIS in Kenya, KLIS Consortium. And we also partner with Visca capacity. So we, we are also there in the work safety so that to ensure that our, our workforce is always um, confident about work at height. So as you can see, this is that this is some of the so the anchor points we supply depending on depending on uh, depending on the substructure that you want to work on. So you can also choose them from our comprehensive catalogs. We have all the detailings, and then you can also look through and choose the one for your, for your, for, for your application. And then this, this, is a, this is an application for, this is just a, a picture that I, I picked to tell you that um, we have, just in East Africa, we have um, we have something that is going on in what is the timber. So this is in Paje, Zanzibar, where we have a, a project that is running through. They are building units for majorly build of a timber a timber frame and a CLT, and they they are building it for the locals and for 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 for, for investors as well. So it is something that. And uh, finally, this is the detailing inside. And then, of course, for, to comp uh, the durability and all this. And then just to tell you also that we we have a, we have a, a, cover, a coverage in terms of the energy efficiency. We also want to reduce more, 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 more carbon and we use more wood. So basically, that is my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you, Felix, for that insightful presentation, showing us all the technical possibilities with regard to heavy and mass timber. And uh, definitely we can see that Rotoblast is a trailblazer in matters timber connectors, building envelopes, acoustic solutions, working, safety, working at uh, heights with their safety uh, harnesses, and also just generally uh, products that are aesthetically appealing. So at this juncture, I'd like to quickly welcome our next presenter, who's uh, architect George Wekesa from BuildX. Architect George Wekesa is a Kenyan licensed architect, an Autodesk uh, Tech Leadership Development Fellow, quality of life and well-being champion, and the mass timber lead at BuildX. Wekesa has worked on projects focusing on alternative building technology to advance environmentally conscious materials, affordable healthcare, and socially responsive design solutions. As a mass timber lead, Wekesa is overseeing the development of BuildX flagship mass timber building in Kenya, him being the primary representative and advocate for mass timber internally and externally, that is in Kenya and East African region. If it, it focused on building and managing key stock. It focuses on building and managing key stakeholder partnerships at BuildX, 
And through this, he, he would be able to steer the long-term transformation of the construction market towards a more sustainable uh, economy using mass timber as a working, uh, as a construction material collaboratively with design impact and real estate development teams to ensure BuildX delivers on its own goals as it seeks to develop pioneering mass timber in the building sector of Kenya. So welcome, Okesa. Uh, thank you so much. I uh, hope you can see my screen. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so thank you for that really comprehensive introduction. Um, yeah, as uh, I think as someone was mentioned, I'm, I'm from the BDX studio. Uh, I'm here to present about uh, the opportunity we have in transforming our, our built environment using Kumba, uh, especially in our fast growing continent in Africa, as well as, well as um, in other applications that uh, we, we uh, possible. Uh, being an engineer's forum, I am being a part of its kind, I sort of started with just thinking through why we need to shift our mindset to building Kumba more than, than we normally do, and also talk about what we as BuildX have, have been uh, investigating in this um, uh, area of building the timber. So I'll talk about uh, how we strategize from uh, building demonstration projects that show the viability of timber, but also looking at the policy side and how we can push uh, government uh, and various ministries to advocate for the change in building codes to accommodate more and more uh, timber structures and the use of timber for structural design. Um, so our population is growing really rapidly, and uh, as at the pace at which it's growing, uh, we would need an equivalent of uh, an entire Paris or an entire New York to be built uh, in the planet every single week for the next 40 years. And the bulk of this population is actually happening in the African continent, with that 5% of all the new construction uh, to occur uh, in the African continent, which means that our embodied carbon emissions will actually really uh, shoot up. Um, buildings, uh, buildings and construction contribute around 39% of all the global carbon emissions, and 11 of, this, uh, 11 of the 39% is normally uh, due to embodied carbon and 28 due to operational carbon. But now, with the fast growing in population and the demand for new construction, if we keep building the way that we're building, 11% will actually uh, overtake the operation emissions. And that's why in the graph I'm showing here, um, it raises the question of how we grow as a continent, how we uh, change uh, the way we build until we meet this growing demand. You can see on the graph, the uh, African continent is the fastest uh, growing, and it's the one that will have a lot of new constructions uh, being done in the next uh, 40 years, uh, followed by China, uh, India, North America, Europe, uh, and at the very end, uh, Russia and the Caspian region. So you, you can see we are really growing very fast, and the demand for uh, infrastructure really pushes us to think more, uh, think hard about how we build, how we influence the planet, how we influence carbon footprints. So building and construction account for the 9% of global carbon emissions, more than any other industry. And 8% uh, of the global carbon emissions come from concrete and steel. So with the understanding of how much steel and concrete contribute to the carbon um, footprint, we definitely need to change the way that we build and what we as BuildX have uh, investigated as a solution that could work uh, for the future or for the long term is looking uh, along the lines of oil based materials, uh, which include uh, timber, bamboo, uh, and, and, and similar materials. Here in this diagram, uh, just more of an overview of what has been happening to our planet uh, for 
a very long time. Uh, you can see on, on your sorry, um, you can see on your, on, on the left here, uh, atmospheric carbon has been balanced out with the terrestrial carbon to natural ecosystems. Uh, but when we invented concrete uh, and started building uh, more high rise, more dense buildings, and as our population increased, you can see that the balance has been uh, has been destabilized here, where we have the rise, as this curve here more or less shows the rise in the carbon being emitted into the atmosphere. So, with our solution of using biogas construction materials, uh, wood and bamboo, uh, and and using that in building our cities, the balance will be be restored, uh, as you can see the right here. Um, but at the, at the basic level of this solution also involves uh, really thinking hard if you truly need to build. Um, well, first, if you, if you can reuse any existing, uh, if it's a housing stock or a commercial office building, that would be the first go to uh, to do that has the, the least implication on, on, on the carbon footprint. But when that is not possible and you really need to build a new building, then you need to spend more time in designing and optimizing. Uh, if, if the structural solutions need to be as optimal as you can, if it's um, architectural solutions, you also need to, to optimize it on, on, on spatial requirements and not just over providing spaces. And thinking about the material, now that you have to do a new building, you have to now start critically looking at what the carbon footprint of the materials they're using so that uh, you're making choices that are that informed. Um, so our solution is broken down into three uh, main categories, how we, we, we are thinking of, about it. First, uh, first naturally filter carbon from the atmosphere and they store them. And when trees are cut down and used for buildings, uh, as in the uh, slide at the center, they store the carbon away for the uh, life of the building. And the, the, if, if the, um, the end of life of the building, um, the fuel can actually be used into other materials, so the carbon will just be kept uh, within the, 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 the timber and not released into the atmosphere. And if we use timber to build uh, buildings and substitute um, elements that would otherwise be built out of steel and concrete, which are the biggest carbon emitters, and that food, carbon footprint that will be occupied uh, by the steel and concrete will be substituted and now with a more positive uh, material uh, that can be renewable. So one is a cube of wood, those uh, one ton of carbon dioxide, meaning that if we made 90% of all new buildings from wood, it will cut global carbon emissions by 4% which is actually more than the carbon footprint of flying. And you'd find that uh, more attention has actually been given to the transport industry with regards to the carbon footprint, uh, the manufacturing industry as well, but it's actually the construction industry which accounts for 9% of all global carbon emissions. And that's why it raises the urgency that it brings. The previous presenter, Felix, touched on uh, mass timber and different technical applications and the, the potential it has in uh, in significantly uh, in significantly substituting uh, steel and um, concrete uh, systems. Uh, I just want to briefly explain the history and what that uh, what the material means and what the different types are. Uh, then go a bit into the benefits uh, so that I think you understand why they actually need to be considered in uh, our building. It's possible the building system uh, not using uh, solid pieces that are bonded together uh, to create panels, beams uh, that are used for different applications. And these uh, panels and beams normally have exceptional strength. Uh, in some cases, even uh, stronger than uh, concrete and, and steel. And Massimo has been in the, in, the, in the research and development phase since the early 90s. 
and the early adopters were mostly Aust Austria and Germany, where um, the construction industry as well as the universities there, they partnered to come up with this product. And since then, uh, it's been really growing uh, with thousands of projects having been already completed across the world. Um, there are different types of, of mass timber. There is a, a blue laminated timber, cross laminated timber, uh, um, lumber veneered uh, laminated timber as well. And the most common type of, of uh, mass timber is cross laminated timber. Uh, this, is, this product is the one that uh, we believe has the potential to actually significantly lower the carbon footprint. Um, from an initial analysis we did in assessing which building components take up the most volume, we realized that actually the floors uh, are the ones that take up uh, a lot of concrete in a building. And by being able to build the floors out of uh, CLT, you'll be able to now significantly lower the carbon footprint. So the CLT is, is a major factory setting, so the precision is normally really uh, controlled and you can achieve uh, different and, and a whole array of, of uh, design solutions because uh, any design option that you want to come up with can be, be cut using a CNC machine. And the assembly on site can be done also in a very quick manner. The benefits of uh, mass timber include a uh, high strength. Um, there are things which have been done to, and ensure that uh, maximum density is 40.5% stronger than steel. Uh, and being light in, in, in weight, it means that there will be reduced transport costs. And uh, uh, the foundations also won't have to bear a lot of loads. They don't have to dig very deep. And the overall cost efficiencies uh, come as a result of having a really light structure. The construction speed is also very high. Uh, uh, it's measured around 40 to 80 percent uh, faster to build compared to traditional traditional building materials. And the quality finishes, as I mentioned before, it's being made in a factory setting. It's easy to control the precision. Uh, how the how the different building elements, including uh, the building services, are fixed together is also something that can be carefully thought through uh, in in the factory. Uh, one big misconception about timber is uh, its fire resistance. Uh, I'll touch a bit more on that in the next slide. Um, also, uh, timber has health and, and well-being benefits. There's studies showing how uh, exposure to timber within the indoor environment uh, can actually reduce your stress levels and really improve your overall productivity uh, if it's in an office setting. Um, Thermal efficiency is uh, really good with the uh, wood being 15 times more efficient than concrete. Uh, and what I've been mentioning about the whole uh, carbon storage as well as the substitution of uh, other very pollutive uh, uh, construction materials, it really does really well in that. So, uh, the concern about the and the hard performance in fire, uh, us, I think it's it, it uh, turns from the idea of not really thinking about this as a as a mass as a mass uh, as a, or a uh, big timber piece. I think if you if you think about it from uh, like a stick object, then you would definitely have the, uh, uh, the the timber really performing very poorly with fire. But when you think about it first as a big log of wood, uh, even when you take um, to take a light and try to set it on fire. It's actually very hard to set it on fire in the first place, but when actually it touches fire, it burns in a very predictable way. The outer layer actually chars and it prevents the fire from penetrating into the inner layers. When you do your structural design, you only uh, account for the, the uh, you account for the charring that will happen on the outside, but also the small bit that will be left inside uh, within the structure that, that would be able to allow the building to stand long enough for uh, intervention to happen with the, with the, with, uh, the fire engineers or the, uh, the, the fire brigades are uh, uh, mitigating the fire in good time. 
Uh, when you compare this to steel and how it behaves, uh, it's very unpredictable. So the predictability of, of, of timber is what actually gives it uh, a good fire, fire safety. Uh, and the other, uh, the other misconception is normally do with um, uh, finding a solution that involves cutting down trees and saying it's one that will actually help us uh, mitigate our carbon emission or climate change. Yes, we are cutting down trees, but these trees have to be from sustainably grown and sustainably harvested uh, processes. Um, what we're trying to do here is we would want build as much demand as possible for the building so that we actually incentivize uh, more and more people to grow forests. If you can earn uh, 20, 30 times more from uh, growing uh, trees, then that incentive is there. But now the pressure for the, to uh, encourage deforestation is actually not something that we would be uh, looking at. Uh, and we've done we've done a research to see uh, how this whole system would work uh, from the forests all the way to uh, thinking about the manufacturing process of course targeted timber, but also uh, how the end result would look like. How do we build the demand of this product, uh, which uh, once we have it in place, we would definitely need it to be in the market and available to everyone. So uh, our, our initial research has shown that uh, in East Africa, we looked at three countries. We looked at Tanzania, uh, Uganda, and Kenya. And uh, uh, I think Kenya, Kenya suffers a lot due to the uh, forest, the, the timber moratorium that actually prevents uh, logging of timber. Uh, but still, we don't have as much forest, sustainable forests compared to Tanzania and Uganda. So we are thinking of this uh, this way, where we are getting timber primarily from Uganda and Tanzania. As we grow our own uh, forests in Kenya, we at the same threshold where we can sustainably have it to sustain uh, a manufacturing uh, factory for for mass timber. But at the same time, Kenya the this opportunity that lies uh, here is the primary processing of wood. So where we have the saw milling capacity as well as the paint drying uh, and the different treatments, uh, it's a CCA for boron for uh, thermite treatment, uh, all of which can be comfortably handled here in Kenya. So that's how we're thinking about it from a very uh, full on value chain that will actually allow us to work as an as a, as a East African bloc. Uh, we, we've, we've done a, a prototype here in Nairobi. Uh, we first did it in Tartu City, and then now we've relocated it to our office in Loreto. Uh, it's open for viewing, and we invite you to uh, visit uh, once the, the relocation process has been analyzed. So it, it's a 50 square meter prototype uh, that's made out of a CLT. And as you can see, the notch down here, it took us uh, 20 hours to set this up. Uh, and it, it's really, uh, it really looks good on the inside in terms of uh, the final product. But just you can just imagine how fast that is in setting up the structure and, and, and doing the, the, the finishes. Um, it might actually took longer, but the structure took 20 hours. And in some cases, uh, you can find that uh, that can actually take less. So we're actually learning as we uh, did this project. We also had some challenges uh, with the equipment, not having adequate equipment, uh, not having uh, uh, the manpower that was clear enough to fit this, but somehow we did it in 20 hours. So it's also something that you can quickly learn, quickly adapt. Uh, we had this prototype as, a, as an exhibition space to show, uh, showcase the material and also to just uh, think about uh, what the market would want to see. So as you can see here, it, it, we had one end that was finished with the uh, masonry cladding, and our idea was 
Uh, this was the end that you would come in uh, and, and, and enter into the space and you'd find uh, a finished apartment that looks like this. And then you wouldn't really know what's behind it because we had put a tent around it. Uh, and you would assume this is just a different brick system or a different material altogether. But then now we did like a, a revelation with this back side of it being made out of timber. And uh, that was really interesting to see how different uh, groups of people reacted to this. Uh, we had invited developers, uh, engineers, uh, uh, government officials, environmental experts, and the like. And from that, we started seeing a lot of traction uh, or a lot of appetite uh, being developed for such buildings and such structures, whereas the misconceptions that were there before were actually also being addressed of even not being a strong material. Uh, so they could they could see, they could touch, they could feel, and, and they could get their uh, concerns answered. So we've also done uh, cost uh, analysis uh, to see how this would be effectively introduced into the market. Uh, for being a new product, definitely it will come at a premium, but with more and more uh, demand, and if we're able to ramp up the demand to meet the same economies of scale as uh, steel and concrete, then definitely it would be uh, a material to be cost competitive. This, this is a mistake that we've seen in the industry where a lot of people come, come to the industry with, uh, with new materials, very sustainable, but uh, the fact is you need the scale to actually get the same competitive prices uh, with steel and concrete. So at the start, we are embracing the high cost. We know that's uh, something that would happen anyway. And that's not necessarily what uh, we are advocating for uh, as a material, advocating for the material for uh, a whole industry, industry shift in terms of uh, the thinking. So we've gone through more short term solutions of how to mitigate the uh, high cost. And here we did uh, a study of a 13 story uh, medium uh, building, residential apartment in Nairobi. And um, one option where we built it out of uh, Cross-nominated timber, and you can see here the cost ranges in terms of cost per square meter. And this is the this, this is the assumption of uh, CLT uh, imported from South Africa. But if we have our own local production, that would be a different case. Because what happened is half of the half of the uh, cost of the material was actually the importation cost. So if we're able to to, to put the uh, the whole demand and supply from the forestry to the market uh, where we strongly advocate for wood and be able to attract investors to set up uh, CLT or massive factory here in Kenya, then uh, this is a product that will be really uh, cost competitive. But there are other options, uh, as you can see here as well, uh, hybrid systems where uh, you have uh, the uh, we have a, a, a reinforced concrete and mass into ground flow, uh, a reinforced concrete staircase stair core, CLT walls, um, and floors for the upper stories. So, you don't do everything out of uh, uh, CLT or mass timber, you substitute certain elements uh, like the core being in concrete um, as well as the ground flow. Um, and in the other hybrid solution, hybrid solution two, uh, the one on the right here, you assume um, the enforced concrete frame uh, with masonry infill, but only have the CLT on the floors. So there are different solutions you can think about because also, uh, as uh, Felix mentioned before, CLT is not, uh, uh, it's not the, we're not saying it can to substitute uh, the materials that are traditionally being used. It's coming to complement them. Uh, because they, are, they also have their strengths and weaknesses. So working uh, with the materials and understanding where they actually fit in the structure is the best way to go. And we also looked at the low spec building and did a similar study. Um, and here, I think we we're looking at how eventually uh, this product will trickle down into the affordable housing market. Uh, but 
as, as I mentioned before, it requires a lot of scale, a lot of uh, impact of the dollar into the market here in Kenya, to a point where we can match the term economies of scale of steel and concrete from, from a manufacturing point, but also from a technical uptake point, where we have more and more engineers uh, who can work with the material, more and more architects who can design the material, more and more, more and more built environment specialists who are actually very, very well conversant with the material. As a, as a light material, it needs uh, uh, a lot of uh, understanding in terms of acoustics, uh, which uh, Felix has touched on a bit, uh, as well as the fire engineering aspects are very key you know, in, in really getting the design to be uh, well well done. And these are, these are not uh, professionals that are really looks into uh, when uh, we're thinking about concrete and steel construction here in Kenya, because often we don't encounter any regulatory challenges with this too. But definitely with uh, building with mass timber, especially for high rise buildings, you encounter a lot of um, this kind of challenges as you go along. So, so beyond what I was talking about, the building up the demand from the manufacturing point, we also need to talk about how we as professionals start uh, equipping ourselves even more technically and understanding how best to build the material. Um, give us a brief um, historical outline of how we've been evolving with using timber over the centuries. So the building uh, on, the, on the left here is uh, uh, the home insurance building in Chicago, which was built in 1885. And this building is around 12 stories, and it was uh, among the very first skyscrapers. And when this building was built, uh, everyone wondered um, if it actually stand. You know, like, there wasn't any tall buildings built back then. And there's a lot of uh, doubts, a lot of questions, and uh, there was a long period when people really did not want to occupy this building because they felt like it could collapse. But uh, over the years, we've really normalized the idea of having tall buildings made out of concrete. Uh, and the picture in the middle here shows a timber building that's even higher than the first building that was ever built. You can see perceptions will be there, but uh, with enough technical information, enough technical capacity, we're able to execute. Uh, buildings built out of timber uh, very well and have these perceptions of trust. Um, our strategy as, 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 as build X, we're thinking of it uh, in three ways. So uh, first having conversations with uh, different stakeholders within the whole value chain of uh, the industry from forests all the way to uh, government and thinking about how we can affect major policy changes. So in the short term, we uh, would be building demonstration projects uh, here in Nairobi or within Kenya. Uh, one being we set off with our prototype, which is at a smaller scale and it's more of an exhibition space. So it's not really a livable space where someone can actually uh, say that for sure uh, this new product works. So we want to do um, a high rise building that would show this concept in a more real life uh, scenario and with a building that can actually be used. And for this first project, we'd have to import our CLT from South Africa. And we'll also be thinking about uh, the Ugandan plantations as the source of the raw material uh, for when um, uh, an investor is really set up at CLT factory, either in Kenya or in East Africa. And as we do this with our projects, uh, as we do the prototype and, and other finance projects, what, one thing we've been learning is um, we need to really lobby for a lot of uh, policy changes. Right now, um, timber, the, the use of timber is not really uh, recognized uh, for structural use within uh, uh, the, the, the existing building code, but the, the 2022 National Building Code, which uh, it's uh, due to be gazetted by Parliament, has uh, provided a legal framework for us to adopt in, in our structural design. So that allows us to use timber 
to, to, to do structures as well uh, and untold structures for that matter. Uh, in the meantime, we look at developing our own Kenyan plantations. Uh, here we are in discussions with the uh, uh, FFS and other forestry players to also influence how we as a country can be able to build our forestry potential uh, and have in country CIT processing. Um, and by the time we have a couple of buildings already done out of mass timber, uh, we are looking at having in building market demand. So uh, from people visiting and experiencing these buildings, we hope that uh, they come out of it convinced and uh, and have the appetite to, to adopt the system themselves. So we put a green building market uh, shoot up or the demand shoot up. Uh, and then at this time, we also expect major policy changes uh, that support uh, green building, whether it's incentives or um, other carbon uh, mechanisms that we can explore that help us build sustainable way, but also in a, uh, an affordable way. Um, in, in, the, in the long term, the opportunity that's there now for, for Kenya or for East Africa, we have small products from forestry, uh, which would increase the uh, income or livelihoods of smallholder farmers. Uh, we would explore export markets of this now manufactured CLT in country, in the, in the country. Uh, so beyond just thinking about it as a, as a product that we're using here, we'll be earning more revenue for the country as well. And by having normalized this system and having enough demand and enough supply within the region, then we'll be able to target the affordable housing uh, market comfortably. And by doing so, we'd align with any climate goals, uh, but providing a solution that's really sustainable. So I'll just briefly talk about one of our projects that is in the pipeline, uh, which is called XLT Tower. Um, this is a project that we are hoping would ramp up a lot of uh, support, a lot of uh, interest in this kind of a building system. Uh, so what you see on the screen is just uh, a vision of the project that we have. We're still in the very early stages of um, doing the design work. Uh, where we've uh, brought a team on board to do the typical uh, knowledge transfer from uh, uh, different European companies to our our, our staff in, in, in Kenya here at Buildex. And imagine this building being one that would be iconic and invested in, in the heart of Nairobi's commercial center. Uh, it will be publicly accessible and setting uh, new standards for sustainable design. So, Thinking, thinking about it from a small scale, uh, from the prototype to this big scale of a building that's about 17 stories, it's a big, it's a big leap. But for us, we think we have to do it in this sort of dramatic way to actually show that uh, it can, can be done at very big heights. And that's how to sort of also demystify certain misconceptions about structural stability, uh, seismic performance, fire resistance, and the like. And we, we've done research on what the uh, real estate market is looking at in terms of uh, green offices. So the demand for certified green offices in Kenya is, uh, or in Nairobi is actually really on the rise. Uh, 18 multinationals uh, have uh, pledged to be net zero uh, by 2040. So many would want to be in buildings, office uh, buildings that are uh, net zero. Um, uh, six, uh, um, around six uh, uh, built areas enrolled under the well uh, building standard since 2020, the first certification for health and, and well being global. You can see that there's a general shift uh, in within the sub Saharan market within Kenya, uh, and especially the big multinationals who have uh, made this. Public commitments, uh, the big pledges to be net zero by a certain time, and this these are the organisations that uh, would be running the industry for a very long time uh, in the near future. And we would want to uh, provide an office space that responds to these needs that now are uh, in the market. So XLT now will aim to deliver the high standards of uh, green building in order to attract the most demanding and environmentally conscious organizations. 
Uh, we've, we've also done a research on the future of work to just understand uh, how the work, work situation would be like uh, post-COVID. Uh, because a lot of uh, companies started uh, doing the hybrid work, a lot of work working from home. So the office spaces were really deserted and we sort put out the need to know how we can either bring uh, the home into the office or, or uh, make the office very attractive for people to actually come back to the offices. So hybrid work is here to stay. We you know that's still the case. So the, when we build our offices, we need to factor this in, into, into account where there is a certain percentage of occupancy uh, reduction that is expected from what used to be. Um, and the purpose of the office is also changing so much, becoming more of a so uh, teamwork uh, collaboration space where people come in at certain times of the week and then they would uh, go out and uh, uh, work independently. And this is also working well for smaller companies who don't have exploring spaces like co-working spaces, which are really uh, working well for small and medium enterprises. But the large multinationals uh, with uh, regional expansion plans yeah, are still considering building their own campus in the medium term. So our, our office building, uh, having understood all these trends, convenient in, in a central location, uh, working access to retail, green spaces and educational facilities, access to a variety of work sessions, uh, larger meeting spaces and social areas, uh, higher consideration of well-being and natural lighting. And what XLT stands for? This is the one we just played around with uh, Build X and Cross Language, so let's kind of mix the two. Uh, but um, as Felix mentioned before, this is, we are not the first uh, to do this in East Africa region. There are developers called CPS who are already uh, developing all buildings in Zanzibar, and we would want to always be in the same space and really uh, take advantage of this uh, opportunity to work as a team and we're really in conversation to see how best we can work collectively as an East African block to build this demand that we are looking at. Um, and uh, below this, some examples of buildings that we also have done case studies of and uh, thinking that would really fit into what we're looking at for uh, um, so we, we have uh, a team that has really unique and massive experience um, and has led some, some of the many uh, complex projects over the course of years. Uh, one being uh, Arup, who are our civil and structural engineers. Uh, we're also working with uh, uh, white architects from uh, Sweden uh, who have a lot of such uh, buildings, and we're very much interested in seeing how we transfer the knowledge here locally so that we, as as, as can help to document this process and be able to share with the industry so that everyone else can, can take advantage of uh, the knowledge we've got so far. Uh, we would still need the team leaders, the designers, uh, leaders, and also uh, developers. Uh, and for this initial phase that we are doing for the project, as I mentioned, it's at a very early on stage. We are receiving funding from the Good Energies Foundation, who so will allow us to develop a technically viable concept that we can be able to talk to uh, the planning officials for approvals. Uh, we can be able to do financial modeling, prove financial viability of the concept, and be able to raise a significant portion of the funding uh, to start the construction. So as also mentioned, in 2021, we built a uh, CAT in that city, and we have fully assembled it in the office. It's uh, really uh, a good space to be in, so I'm uh, welcoming you all to visit it soon. Um, we're still setting it up, but the, the best will be okay soon. Um, and, and, and the overall impact we're looking at with this is uh, Massive being a, a very climate friendly substitute to uh, concrete and steel, 
we've definitely reduced the carbon emissions in the building and the studies that show uh, how uh, your exposure to timber within the indoor space uh, lowers your blood pressure, reduces stress, and improves your concentration levels, which in work environments has the overall performance advantage. Uh, also, we're looking at uh, doing this for a behavioral change or a system change, where people are more willing to um, to adopt the material if they actually see it being in use. And we, we can talk about it on paper, all that we can, but if we actually build buildings uh, and a considerable number of them and people see them, this is the only way we can be able to uh, influence uh, behavior and system change. So behavioral changes in the sense of perceptions of people with uh, climate uh, resistance, uh, structural performance, and system change uh, to do with building codes, uh, amendments, or implementation. For example, putting pressure for the 2022 uh, uh, national building code that enforced. And our strategy for now is uh, uh, we would uh, build a, we would have a technically viable concept as a goal that we would charge to different investors to invest in it. Uh, but once we've uh, uh, done the construction, we would want to exit the project one year after after handover. Um, we we have uh, we're, we're operating more on a, on a, on a rent or build to lease. Um, model and the project value is at around 30 million US dollars. So it's quite significant, uh, but we're happy that we, uh, uh, we and our partners are at a point where we've, uh, we, we've, we've seen the action in, 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 in the partnership in raising the money. So we, we think that actually being a possibility in the coming years. Um, the incentive that we're also exploring to lower the costs uh, we have the uh, green financing facilities that are available uh, that I think also it's one thing that us as uh, in the built environment should, should know that once we are able to demonstrate that our buildings uh, significantly lower the carbon footprint, we can be able to get financing that Is this uh, also how we should also think about it? We should just think about it from uh, this single entity of, of the building material, but also think about it holistically about uh, other green financing aspects that are available. Um, this is more or less the timeline we have for the for the project. So uh, now we are at the design phase. Uh, in the middle of the year uh, to mid next year, doing more of development activities. So talking to different off takers and uh, doing more detailed design, uh, showing that the building permits are in place. And then uh, within the following two years, uh, we would do the construction handover and the capacity building. And as I mentioned, we would exit the project right after the construction. Um, I think I think both architects and engineers. Uh, have a responsibility to uh, advocate for the building uh, in need because for us to trigger major policy changes, uh, we need the demand to actually be there to put pressure on the government to really act on this. So I would ask everyone on the call, everyone um, listening to this to really um, think about the advantages that we've talked about and how uh, building with wood brings a lot of things. Uh, so that we can be able to transform our uh, parking industry project. I think. Thank you, Akesa, for that good presentation, showing us the good work that the team at BuildX is doing in the space of promoting timber as a sustainable construction material. I would like to implore all attendees to make time when uh, 
the prototype will be reassembled in the fourth quarter of this year to go and see what uh, what uh, feel, uh, tangible feel on what uh, timber can timber is capable as a capable of as a construction material and appreciate uh, how we can use it in our environment. The future with regard to timber design is looking bright with the proposed CLT plant by BuildX, definitely, and also uh, the proposed building code that is, has incorporated timber design uh, to a, a good extent. So we look forward to seeing all those happen in the near future. At this point, I'd now like to welcome our last presenter of the day. And uh, I'd like us all to welcome Andrew Lawrence, a fellow and director at ARU. Andrew Lawrence is a fellow and director at ARU, the Royal Academy of Engineering, visiting, is a visiting professor at the, Royal, uh, at the Cambridge University, uh, a UK representative on the European Timber Design Code Committee, a lead author for appraisal and repair of timber structures published by the Institution of Civil Engineers, that is ICE, Andrew lectures worldwide on the structural use of timber and is working to help make timber a safe, durable, mainstream construction material. His past projects include the highly acclaimed Mez Pompidou, Canary Wharf Crossrail Station Roof, and the Smile, which is the world's first hardwood CLT structure. So I'd like to welcome Andrew to talk to us on uh, structural timber at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk today. Um, let me just um, share my screen. Now, I would like to answer the question, when does using wood really make sense? What's the potential for it in construction? The, now, this slide um, <clears throat> shows you um, some of the tallest timber buildings built across the world in the last 10 years. And I think this might leave you with the impression that wood is always the answer for every building. But the reality is that every bit, every material is different. Every material has pros and cons. And so let's try and understand when wood really makes sense. Now, people often say if we're going to use more wood, surely wood can't really last. So I love to show this. This is a church near London, and this was built nearly 1,000 years ago. And I think this shows if you keep wood dry, then it really can last forever. The, by keeping it dry, it means there's not enough moisture there for the fungus to survive. Fungus, like all organisms, needs water to, 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 to survive. And so here we can see that the wooden wall is actually kept dry by an overhanging roof and it's lifted up off the ground. But we do, <clears throat> we do need to remember that most mass timber so far has been used in northern temperate climates. So if we're going to start using wood in hotter climates, we need to remember there are also insect risks. And that means that as well as keeping the wood dry and out of the rain, we probably also need some sort of chemical protection to protect the wood against insects, termites, etc. Now, I think the real challenge with wood is that it grows in these very awkward shapes and sizes. And if you think about it, not only are these trees that you might think they're um, cylindrical, but actually they're conical. And so if we're going to use those trees efficiently to cut them up into smaller pieces, we have to cut those trunks into fairly short lengths. Otherwise, there's huge bits of tapering wastage that we cut off the sides. Now, the real breakthrough in wood construction was the development of really good waterproof glues. And I show you the mosquito because those glues were developed in the 30s and the mosquito aircraft was one of the first uh, structural uses of those new waterproof wood glues. And so what you can see on the left is a detail of the wing um, spar. You can see a tiny little glue lamb beam and then you can see the sort of the, 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 the plywood um, sheathing forming the structure of the wing. 
So now what we can do is we can take short planks of wood, small planks of wood cut from the tree, and we can glue them end on end into much longer lengths. And this is what we call, we do that using what we call a finger joint. Um, so it's like bringing two sets of fingers together. And what that gives us is a nice long length of glue loaded in shear. Obviously, if we want a strong tension connection, what we wouldn't do is just butt the ends of the wood because that could easily just unzip. Now, then um, we um, can take those long lengths of wood, we pass them through a glue curtain. And what you see here is you see resin and hardener and the resin and hardener get mixed on the surface of the wood. Um, and then we stack those planks up overnight and clamp them together until the glue has cured. <clears throat> And of course, while the glue is still wet, um, we can actually um, we, we, we can mold that into a curved beam rather than the straight beam. So we can make curved glue lamb beams very easily. Now, there's another advantage of laminating apart from making larger members. And the fact is that um, a tree actually has lots of natural defects in it. And the most important natural defects are the knots. The knots are just the remains of the branches where those branches were plugged into the main trunk. But you can imagine those, the, 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 those knots which we're left with are almost like holes cutting right the way through the strong fibers in the trunk. Um, and you can imagine if one of those knots or holes is down at the bottom of the section cutting through the highly stressed bending fibers, that's really going to reduce the strength. Whereas if the knot's in the middle, it's going to have less impact. And so there's a huge variation in the strength of pieces of wood cut from the same tree. But if we take the trunk of a tree, chop it up into lots of pieces and glue those pieces randomly together, then those defects are distributed. Those knots, those holes don't go all the way through and we end up with a stronger overall member. So two real reasons for making laminated glue lamp beams. The first is to make much larger pieces and the second is to make stronger pieces. Um, and I show the, this is the largest glue lamp beam I've ever seen. This was, um, and I compare this against a typical um, Arab engineer. Um, <clears throat> so a typical Arab engineers are about 1.7 meters high or so. And you can see this beam is about 40 meters long um, and about two meters high. Um, and really, the maximum size of glue lamb beam is really limited by um, the really limited by transport and also what the factories can make. Um, and certainly in Central Europe, um, the factories um, can make glue lamb beams up to about 40, 40 meters long. Um, now, um, the big change, as I alluded to at the start, is that we're starting to see wood used for much larger buildings. Um, and this is an example of one here. And I think the question has to be, why is that? And I would like to suggest that it's thanks to three quite recent technological innovations. The first one is um, what we really call digital fabrication. Um, the, um, <clears throat> this is a photograph I took in 2005. And at this time, this was the only digital fabrication in the entire um, structural timber industry. Now this is something that every factory has. And the point is that because we can machine wood very easily with digital fabrication, we can machine it to incredibly high tolerances. And this, in fact, is the project that we use that for. This is one of the first timber projects in the world achieved using digital fabrication. And we had 459 different pieces. Um, they obviously couldn't have done that before digital fabrication came along, um, and but without wood, which could be machined so easily to very high tolerances, perhaps plus or minus one or two millimeters. Now, the second innovation is CLT, cross laminated timber. Now, it was actually invented some time ago, back in about the 1990s, but it's only been cheaply available for about the past 10 years. And the third innovation, um, and you've heard a little bit about this from Rotterblas, um, is really modern um, timber connections, which have really made timber connections stronger and brought down the cost. Um, the, and I think one of the most interesting is, is the very simple screw, but not short traditional screws, but these modern 
long, high strength steel, self tapping screws, no need for pre drilled holes. You can insert that screw, as you'll see here, um, in about um, 20 or 30 seconds. And that screw, working in tension, can carry something like the weight of a car, something like about one ton. Um, so the idea that we have connections that we can make very fast and which are very strong. And so if we add these three innovations together, cross-laminated timber, accurate digital fabrication, and fast, strong connections, then we can imagine that our timber building becomes like a giant piece of flat pack furniture. I use this as an example. This was a 40 meter long sculpture that we built in London. Um, and that entire sculpture was built in just uh, five days. Um, so speed of construction is really what we get with timber. But of course, with speed of construction come huge savings in construction costs because there's savings in labor costs, there's savings in craneage. Um, the, and so what we're starting to see, certainly in Europe, in North America, and we're starting to see the um, total cost of a timber building um, now being quite similar to the total cost of a building in traditional materials like steel or concrete. And so since about 2010, we're starting to see um, buildings like this, entirely made of CRT, um, um, coming up all over the world. The one on the left was in London, that was eight stories of CRT, and the one on the right in, uh, um, that's in Melbourne in Australia, um, that was back in 2012, and that was nine stories of CRT. Um, and you can see how an entirely CLT building, CLT walls, CLT floors, really lends itself to sort of cellular spaces, residential type construction. Now, if we want to do more um, open plan construction, perhaps for offices or for schools, well, we can, can combine our prefabricated CLT slab with a steel frame, as you see here. Um, or perhaps we can combine it, um, the glue lamp beams, with a concrete slab to make a timber concrete composite. I think these hybrid forms, combining timber with other materials, are very, very interesting. Um, the, but what we need to remind ourselves um, is that we all our building codes, um, even the Euro code in Europe, was written about 30 years ago. And 30 years ago, we were designing two or three story buildings in timber, not 20 story buildings. Um, and that's that's very, very important to remember um, that um, timber is, is uh, mass timber on a large scale is very much a new method of construction. And um, the reason for remembering that is that with any new method of construction, it takes time for safe methods of design to be developed. Um, and just to give you an example, I think we've all heard of Ronan Point. Um, in the 1960s, precast concrete construction became very, very popular. Um, people built taller and taller and taller in precast concrete very quickly. I think it went from, in 1960, it went from three or four stories high. By um, 1969, it was up to about 20 stories. Um, and then, of course, there was a small gas explosion in somebody's kitchen, um, and that led to this sort of collapse. Um, and then um, <clears throat> the design methods after that started to improve people started to realize they needed to tie the panels together better. Um, now, I just want to emphasize there's nothing wrong at all with precast concrete construction. Um, it's uh, Perhaps it has sustainability issues, but from a safety point of view, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's simply that with any new form of construction, it does take time for safe methods of design to be developed. Um, and so the question I really wanted to raise is, if we're pushing timber to much greater heights very fast, how can we avoid those sorts of um, uh, errors, safety issues, which occur with any new form of construction? Now, the great thing is that there is a huge body of research going on across the world. Um, what you see here, in fact, is some of the top timber researchers from across Europe. This was a meeting in our office in London um, about five years ago now. Um, and in fact, these are the individuals who are currently updating the Eurocode. There will be a new timber Eurocode published in 2025, which is written with these much larger timber buildings in mind. The, now, the point is that we are, um, timber is very different from the materials we are used to using. 
If we think about the function of a tree, the function of a tree is to get water from the ground up to the leaves. Um, and so um, we can really think about a tree like a bundle of drinking straws. What you're looking at here is actually a microscopic image of um, the trunk of a tree. And you can see it's just like a bundle of drinking straws. And if we think how a bundle of drinking straws behaves, it's very strong parallel to the bundle. We can squash it, we can stretch it, but across the width, it's really quite weak. We can pull those straws apart, we can squash them quite easily. And so we have this material, which is much stronger, parallel to the fibers, parallel to the grain, than it is perpendicular. And that's very, very different from something like steel, that we're used to using as structural engineers. Of course, steel has got similar properties in all directions. Now that has all sorts of implications. Um, the, now, um, first of all, it does tend to make wood quite brittle. Now, this was the first time I ever saw a timber connection being tested. Inside here, you can't see, but there's some steel work fixed in with those steel dowels. Um, and this was being stretched apart. And I was standing there with my video, very excited to see what would happen. And of course, what happened was absolutely nothing. And then suddenly there was a bang and it snapped and it looked like this. And that's what we call a brittle failure. And of course, we are much more used to working with materials like steel, which fail in a ductile fashion. And even reinforced concrete, if we think about the reinforced concrete codes, we go to great lengths to under reinforce the concrete, to underdo the amount of steel in the concrete, just to make sure that the steel fails first, to make sure that the concrete fails in as ductile a way as possible. So if we have a, a brittle material like timber, that's very different from the steel and concrete we're used to, and we have to really change the ways that we design. Now, another implication of wood being fibrous, like a bundle of drinking straws, is in fact, it's incredibly strong and light, um, and that has all sorts of advantages. We can reduce the number of uh, lorry truck deliveries to site by perhaps four or five times. We can reduce the weight on the foundations, reduce the weight on the columns. So all of that can save materials and save energy. Um, but of course, because a wooden floor is so light, it's going to be much more susceptible to vibration. The, we all know the simple equation F equals MA. So if, the, if we jump up and down on the floor with a force F, if the mass of the floor, the weight of the floor is less, then the acceleration is going to be higher, it's going to be livelier. And so we must remember that a wooden floor is not governed by strength, it's not governed by stiffness, a wooden floor is always governed by dynamics. And this was us actually doing some testing on one of our completed buildings, and we have fed the results of that testing back into the new Eura code, which will be published in two years' time, to make sure that we can, all of us will be able to accurately predict how these timber buildings behave so that we can match the performance, match the dynamic performance of any other material. The, now, I would suggest that the third um, a, a difference with wood compared to other materials is that it is combustible. Um, now, George and Mr. Bocasa has explained um, that um, wood actually chars very slowly. Um, and therefore, a wooden building can stand for a certain period of time in a fire. And that's that's correct. And that works very well for a smaller structure. <clears throat> but because it's combustible, it is possible for the timber to carry on burning until the building eventually collapses. Now, if we're going to build taller buildings in timber, then we really have to prevent collapse because people could be trapped inside the building. And so another reason why we need to rethink how we design buildings. So all of those sort of three reasons, it's lightweight, it's combustible, it's, it, it, it's brittle. And let me just give you a few examples. So this is the um, largest timber roof currently in the UK. This is the new research building for uh, Land Rover. And now each of the panels of this roof is about 15 by 15 meters. So these are huge. The whole roof is something like two football pitches. Um, now you can see that architecturally, this appears to be a grillage. And so if we were designing that in steel or in concrete, we would indeed design a two-way grillage with moment connections everywhere. 
But we need to remember that timber is a brittle material and we need really to understand where the loads are going and, and make ourselves a nice determinate structure. And so what we do is we actually design that as a one way spanning structure with short infill pieces to make it look as if it's two way spanning. Not only does that mean that we can confidently design it in the brittle material and define the failure points so we can make sure it's safe, it also actually makes a cheaper structure because moment connections in timber are incredibly expensive. Um, and so if we can make nice, simple pinned connections, that's always the better route to follow. So determinant structures, pinned connections. Now, to give another example, um, the I often think that um, engineers need pushing um, and we need pushing by our architectural colleagues. And um, in this particular instance, the team, the architecture in Amsterdam challenged us to build the tallest timber building in the world. Um, and so this is actually a 21 story building, 18, 18 floors of timber on top of three floors of concrete. Now. The uh, first thing that we as engineers start to think about with tall buildings is how do we make the building stiff enough to so it's not too lively under wind loading. Now, what's interesting, of course, is there's a big difference between a wall made of lots of CRT panels joined together and an in situ concrete wall. And particularly if we try and build a 20 storey high wall out of lots of CRT panels, there's lots of opening and closing and sliding of the joints between all the panels. And it simply isn't possible to make those walls stiff enough to, to stabilise the building. Um, and so if you look at this building in Amsterdam, Hout, and in fact, if you look at almost any tall timber building, you will find it's actually stabilised by a concrete, floor, uh, concrete core. Um, certainly any timber building above probably about 10 storeys and in seismic zones, probably timber buildings above three or four storeys will always have concrete cores. And I think there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with mixing the materials, using each material to its best advantage. The, now, um, what, what, what about dynamics? What about fire? So, um, well, you can see here the floor construction and you can see how we actually stop the floor slab either side of the party wall because we didn't want the floor vibrations to be transmitted from one apartment to the apartment the other side of the wall. And um, so um, we've stopped and started the slab like that. Um, and the other thing that you can see here is that most of the wood is covered over. And that's very common. You'll find for fire safety, we do, and particularly in taller buildings, have to cover over most of the wood. And so, <coughs> sorry, there's a terrible cough going around London at the moment. Um, the, but um, just, just to finish, what's, wh wh where do I think timber really makes sense? And my view is actually that the natural home of wood is low rise buildings and um, low rise buildings, partly because those are the buildings where there are much lower fire risks so that we can often leave the wood exposed. If it's an office or a school, we can definitely leave the wood exposed. Um, that means we can save on the cost and the carbon cost of all the finishes. And we can get something which is a much lower carbon footprint compared to um, other materials. Now, we can also build taller in wood and we can build a building entirely out of CLT um, up to about 10 storeys or so. Now, you really won't see any or much of the wood because obviously a residential building has very tight fire requirements to make sure that nobody gets um, nobody gets hurt, has very tight acoustic requirements to get acoustic separation. And to meet the fire and the acoustic requirements means that um, all the wood really is going to be encapsulated in finishes. Um, so that very much works technically. It is going to affect the, um, the carbon footprint of the building. It's not going to be as good as if it was pure timber. And it's, it's probably still better than other ways of building, but it's um, the... Um, but, 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 but not quite as good. Um, 
And I think the third thing is if we want to build taller, um, then very much it's going to be hybrid type constructions like I showed you. It doesn't make sense, as I said, to use wood for the stability structure. It's not stiff enough. Um, it doesn't really make sense to use wood for the columns because those columns in wood would simply get too big because it's quite a weak material. Um, but it does make sense to use wood in the floors to lighten the weight of the floors. And that means we can reduce the weight of the, the size of the columns, reduce the weight of the foundations. Um, so. Um, um, that's uh, so for a taller building using timber that's uh, the, the um that that's quite an interesting way to go um and just to finish i just wanted to say that um uh, I think a really good timber building doesn't only need a good engineer who understands the material, it also needs a good architect. And I think particularly if the wood is going to be exposed, that's because the structure is the architecture and the architecture is the structure. And so both designers need to really understand the material. Um, and I show you this. This is one of my probably my favorite projects. We did this with um, a wonderful architect, Alison Brooks. Um, this was the first um, structure in the world made of large hardwood CLT panels. And um, the reason I wanted to show you this is that um, the it entirely grew, the geometry entirely grew out of the size of CRT panels which we could make and the size of CRT panels which we could transport. Um, and so I think that's important to remember with reinforced concrete, it's we really can build something to any dimensions that we want because it's a cast material. But with timber, it is prefabricated in the factory. So the, um, the it's prefabricated, it needs to be transported to site. And so we need to understand the size of those prefabricated elements and use that to inform the geometry of the structure. And uh, just my final image, this was my, one of my final views of, of, of the smile, which was the, my favorite views, which was the view inside. Um, and it's just to say, um, the I do think that there is huge potential, uh, sorry, um, I shouldn't have done that. Um, the, um, I, th I do think there's huge potential to use um, more wood in construction. The, but it is a different material um, and we need to understand the material so that we can use it well and safely and understand the sorts of buildings where it really makes sense. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I'd like now to go into the Q&A session in the interest of time. So we'll take a few questions. And uh, the first one is from Timothy Namunaba. He's asking how effective is the Titan plate bracket connection on a timber beam member subject to traditional moment? I think that uh, that is one Felix can address. And then, Next one is um, next one is asking from uh, Lord Fikas Katimi, what are some of the measures of fire resistance with regard to timber as a construction material? Because this is a key weakness for timber material. I think uh, that can be addressed by Lawrence. And um, let's take those two first. Thank you. Thank you, Nation. Thank you, Timothy, for the question. Uh, the question concerning the Titan plate, this is a plate that has a very good uh, shear resistance and all this. So I, if you like, I would share the technical data sheet with the, the technical information about the the torsion and all this. So yeah, we have a comprehensive data sheet. You can easily get this information here. I can uh, share a link on the chat box where you can access this. Thank you. So in terms of the fire resistance, um, I think it's important to distinguish between low rise, low risk buildings, such as schools and offices, and um, higher rise, high risk buildings, particularly residential buildings. So with the um, with the lower risk, lower rise buildings, um, the timber, as we've heard, actually chars quite slowly. And so a timber member can retain adequate strength for maybe one or two hours if it's a large enough cross section. 
We have to be careful with the steelwork. So conventionally, the connection steelwork would be encapsulated inside the timber to protect it from the heat of the fire. The, we can't cover it now, but um, intumescent paints on steel are not appropriate <clears throat> in conjunction with wood. Um, now, for a larger timber building, particularly if there's a sleep risk where people are asleep and they could get trapped inside the building, then it's really important to make sure that that building actually um, uh, doesn't collapse in the fire, that after the fire, the building is still standing. And the, I'm not a fire expert, I'm, I'm a structural engineer, but broadly, the, uh, the, the main ways to achieve that is to limit or even avoid any exposed timber, any visible timber, and to make sure that the timber is properly encapsulated behind fireboard. And there's very careful seals around all the service penetrations and, and, and things like that, really to make sure that the fire can never get at the timber at all. Thank you, Andrew and Felix. Uh, Daniel Nyaga is asking uh, what preservatives that can be used or, on water submerged timber structures. I think uh, also Andrew can take on that. Sorry, and, could you just repeat the start of the question? It was water submerged structures? Yes, a type of uh, timber preservative, waterborne preservatives that can be used on water submerged timber structures. Right. Well, um, timber which is completely submerged below water level is not at risk of rot because there's no access to oxygen. So, for example, the whole of Venice is supported on timber piles, but those timber piles are below the water line, so they can't rot. So the risk is where the timber um, emerges through the water and where there's therefore both water and oxygen. Um, the, traditionally, there are two types of preservative used. Um, one is copper-based preservatives, which are reasonably well fixed into the timber. Um, the second is creosote. Um, the, but creosote is very toxic, but for environmental reasons, it's used less and less. But traditionally, that is what was used a lot for uh, marine type structures. Um, the, um, but the, 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 the health and safety friendly route these days would be to use copper based preservatives. But I should say that the life will still be relatively short um, because of the very um, severe conditions. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, architect Wakesa uh, Chavulimi Eric is asking uh, is asking for you to comment on some sound transmission, especially between floors when you are using timber as a construction material. Yeah. Uh, so as I mentioned before, timber uh, is a very light material and doesn't uh, perform really well in terms of uh, sound insulation. So uh, I think that touched on this briefly, mentioning how you need to increase the density so that the, uh, the, the material is more robust to prevent sound transmitting. And uh, this, this is one of the applications that's normally done, especially on floors where you add an extra layer of uh, concrete, or you can add a, a scred, or you can have a, a space in between and uh, that does uh, the sort of uh, buffering for the noise transmission. But those are the different acoustic requirements holistically uh, that you need to look at. So if spaces are flanking each other or just adjacent to each other, there's also an explanation that you need to do from uh, to prevent the flanking noise from being transmitted through the wood. And there's uh, applications, surface applications that you can uh, use. Um, and uh, also to prevent um, noise from being transmitted from, from the streets. There's also how you need to design uh, your windows to li limit how the reflection of the sound happens. This, these are just some of the rule, rules of sound that uh, you use. Uh, I'm, I'm not really an acoustic engineer, but at least from the knowledge, knowledge I've gathered, uh, different treatments that you, you need to do on top of just having the, the timber surfaces uh, to make them uh, perform well with sound and speaking on the box. There's also a question from Timothy Musiomi. Uh, he's saying a good presentation. 
kindly share some cost comparison between timber and other competing materials that is steel, masonry, and concrete for buildings. So maybe Wakesa, you can go first, then we can get also a response from Andrew on the same. So uh, as I mentioned before, the, the, the like uh, timber now, since it's a new, if entering the market, uh, it's a fresh material that's really expensive uh, to build it because there's no enough demand to, to sort of uh, make the prices be competitive. But I think even internationally, uh, uh, building with, with wood is something that you can acquire a lot of optimization processes to get it to a point where it's price competitive. So in terms of cost, uh, the biggest challenge now is because we have to import it. Uh, and I mentioned before, half the cost of the PLT that we use for our prototype was due to the importation cost. But when you think about the cost of the raw material straight from the factory, uh, it was within the ranges of uh, 40 to 70,000 things per square meter, which is, is close enough to what you would have for steel and concrete locally. But once we have local production, then we'll be able to uh, really scale that up. Shall I add? So I think our experience is it depends on the location. Um, but um, we have found that the cost of the bare timber structure, um, the even in Europe, um, is more than the cost of the bare concrete or the steel structure. It's really important to realise that where timber becomes competitive is the total building cost. Um, the, because a lot of the savings are in less foundations, uh, shorter construction time and therefore labour savings. Um, the <clears throat> perhaps less finishes. Um, so um, the, the the general European experience um, is that um, it, it's now um, can be it, it, the if you've designed in timber from the start, don't try and start with a concrete or a steel building and then uh, adapt it to timber. You really need to work with the material and come up with sensible um, spans, et cetera, to match timber. But if you do that, our general experience is that um, the total building cost um, can very roughly um, match the total building cost in, um, in, 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 in other materials. Uh, lastly, uh, there's, some, there's a question from Ahmad Sabri. How do you deal with plumbing fixtures, uh, water penetration, and sealing in wooden structures? And uh, what is the largest pan that uh, a slab supported on timber, joists, and columns can span uh, in high res structures or any other structure for that matter? So, Andrew, can you can you share some insight on that? Yes. Um, broadly, in terms of spans, um, I think CLT is economic up to about six metres or so. Beyond, beyond about six metres, that's when these, um, for example, the timber concrete composite starts to make more sense. Um, the um, Otherwise, the CLT slab gets very, very thick and expensive above about six metres. Um, in terms of durability and water, um, I think if we focus on the most vulnerable things, which are flat roofs, then the, 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 the broad um, advice to follow for timber is to provide two lines of defence against water and to have a warning of if there is a leak. So we all know that um, <clears throat> water can easily break the first line of defence and hence the logic of having a second line of defence. Um, the And if we have a CLT, say, used for a flattish roof, the, the, the point is that the water can sit on top and it can rot on top and you won't know from looking underneath. And so hence the importance of having uh, a, a some sort of um, warning of leaks. That warning of leaks, it could be some water sensors built into the build-up. Um, or it could be having an air cavity on top of the CLT and perhaps a slight fall to the CLT. So that if any water is getting through, it can slope off the top and then you can see it. Um, you can see it leaking and you can do something about it. So but always with timber in terms of you've got to protect timber from water all the time. 
There's no there's no other good solution. Two lines of defense and um, a warning of any leaks. And I would use exactly the same principles for a um, a, a shower room um, or um, a, a kitchen or, or, or something like this. Thank you, Andrew. So it seems like uh, we have very good comments from all the attendees. And uh, the, the recurring question is that uh, are all presenters going to, are they comfortable sharing their presentation with the attendees after this session so that they can access the material and go through it uh, at their own time? So that's, that's the request from the attendees. And I'd like at this point to take it back to Engineer Muguru, to the program back to Engineer Muguru for, to conclude the program, yes. Hello, thanks everyone for attending and thank you for, to all the speakers. We've learned a lot on timber design. Yes, we're hoping that they're going to be sharing their presentations, which we will mail to all the attendants. You'll get a Google link, we'll upload them and then at one place and then you'll get a Google link so that you're able to access all of them. I think it's always easier done that way. So at this point, I would like to call engineer Paul Carrara, our treasurer. He's supposed to give the vote of thanks. Engineer Carrara. Uh, thank you, uh, Mogoro. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Carrara current treasurer of uh, AAK engineers chapter and uh, incoming chairman of the chapter. Uh, we've just had our elections, the term of the previous council has uh, ended. Um, I want to say we are very grateful to um, for our speakers who have graced our webinar, um, particularly uh, grateful to Rothblas and the presentation by Felix Odera, uh, quite insightful on um, some of the um, you know the facilities that you are uh, um, selling in partnering with timber i was particularly uh, interested in some of the connection details which help us which can help one to achieve uh, quite aesthetic and uh, structurally functional uh, um, connections in timber um, i think uh, most of our structural engineers could be more used to you know nails and uh, these things which don't look too too tidy and the uh, angles, uh, you know, still uh, mild steel angles. Um, I'm, I'm also um, keen to appreciate the presentation by architect George Kesa from Buildex, quite insightful, um, with some unorthodox, uh, you know, advantages of timber. As we, we, we one would have thought the disadvantages of timber would be in fire resistance, uh, environmental. Uh, sustainability but quite the contrary we've had there is uh, quite some um, it, it's quite the opposite i think we'll be keen to to learn more about these things uh, once we get the presentations also very pleased uh, to listen to the presentation by engineer andrew lawrence of arab uh, very insightful on use of timber i noted uh, from his second slide that he's also a photographer the photographer the caption says copyright andrew lawrence uh, <laughs> well done. Uh, it was a very good presentation. We really learned a lot. As structural engineer, I'm a structural engineer myself. Quite, I picked up quite a bit of uh, stuff that I would want to read more. I think we can't get everything in this one short uh, webinar, but I'm sure we can follow it up. And uh, it just opens up to what the potential of uh, timber is and uh, which line to look at when you are considering timber. Um, I'm also very grateful uh, for all our attendees and participants who uh, have graced this webinar. We had 156 at some point. I think it got to 5 p.m. and some people left their offices, so the numbers dropped. But I think the, the webinar generated quite a bit of interest, which is uh, good, it is encouraging, um, even to our partners, uh, Buildex, uh, Rotoblast, Araf, um, you can see there is interest. You can expect uh, quite a bit of uh, follow-up. We shall be facilitating our members. Like we said, you uh, will be glad if you could share the presentations uh, so that we can share them across and people can be able to, uh, to follow up. I've seen even a question about whether you can share some contacts uh, and to appreciate that uh, at least you've got some positive response. 
So if anyone wants to follow up, they can uh, they can follow up, especially those who dropped off at some point. We also um, would like to acknowledge uh, we were joined by the our vice president or first vice president of AAK, um, architect Fra Florence Nyole. Uh, we want to note that uh, she has taken very keen interest in uh, our chapter's activities. Um, we thank her for for that. It it is it is good for the you know unity and uh, harmony of AAK as a larger organization. We wish her well in our uh, upcoming elections. As you heard, she's vying for president, and we wish her well and look forward to working together. Um, I would also want to thank our AAK team, uh, led by the outgoing chairman, uh, engineer Justo Sotwani. Uh, for guidance. This could probably be your last webinar as chairman. Thank you very much for uh, for being with us through all these uh, two years, all the webinars we've had. Guided us so well as I take over. I'm looking forward to your guidance and wisdom so that we can keep running them well and having successful uh, webinars. Um, I particularly want to thank um, uh, members of my new council, uh, uh, Mugoro Irimo and uh, Nashon Tambo, for putting this together. I think uh, I'm looking forward to a very easy time with such a great team. They did quite a bit of work in a very short time to put this uh, together. Um, at this juncture, probably to thank uh, Andrew for accepting the invitation, I think on very short notice. <laughs> we, at some point, we didn't know uh, whether we'd get a structural engineer, uh, uh, but we got the most competent, <laughs> the most appropriate one. So we are very happy and uh, grateful for that. Um, we also want to thank uh, Secretariat team for partnering with us, for facilitating all this. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Lastly, uh, I think as you've heard from Mogoro, we are going to be uh, you, to, to be getting the presentations which we are going to circulate to the attendees and uh, anyone interested. Uh, you'll also be getting as uh, EBK, as uh, EBK CPD uh, professional development units. Uh, you'll get certificates which you can upload and uh, claim the, the CPD points. I think with that, we come to the end. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Anyone I might have forgotten to mention in person, do not take it for granted. We are very uh, appreciative of your presence and participation in this webinar. Thank you very much. Okay. Back to you. Thank, you. thank you so much, Engineer Carrara. And I think now we are at the tail end, but before we are we, we leave, I would like to wish all engineers a happy World Engineering Day tomorrow. That's our world tomorrow is World Engineers Day. So happy World Engineers Day 2023. You'll be getting emails with the certificates, especially for the engineers to upload to BK so that you can claim your PDUs. Thanks, everyone. So I think we now come to the end of it. We hope to interact more. Any, if you, in case you need to contact us, you can contact us using our Twitter handle, engineers at AAK, or using our email, in, engineers at aak.or.ke. Yeah. So bye, everyone. Bye, Mugoro. Thank you, everyone.